this. Let me. What was it like when when they shut everything down? Like once once you got the word, like, hey, we're closing the facility, and we mm-hmm. got to figure out where to put you guys. Um, I feel like being a human being first. It was like, okay, at least at least we're gonna make sure we get this right. You know, at least we're gonna make sure we're gonna be safe. Make sure our family's gonna be safe. Um, because I think that was kind of like the top of everybody's, you know, list was making sure our families are cool. But you know, like we're still showing up for work every day. You see other athletes are getting it. You know, it started with you know a soccer player over in Europe and then obviously NBA guys, right? And you know, we, we wanna make sure like we're not bringing something home to them. So, you know, in the beginning of this, that's that that's what it was for us. It was like, all right, cool, you know, kind of sigh of relief there, but then it's also like, you know, no one would have imagined this, right? You know, so, you know, it was just like, all right, let's figure out how to work out and still do stuff. So, you know, you still had guys um, that were out here in Arizona going to the complex, working out in small groups. And this is before they banned everything. Um, you know, we were like, hey, we're going to make the most of this. We're going to work out. We still got the weather. We still got the field. Let's do it. And then they said, all right, well, then you can't go inside. So, you know, initially that day, I remember it. The guys that knew they were going to stay out here in Arizona, we said, all right, well, let's go to the weight room. We're going to take anything we can out of here that we can get in our car and take to the house so we can work out at the crib. And and that's what it's been since, bro. You know, that's that's what it's been since. How scary was it? Um, I think because we didn't have to linger too long, you know, and, and kind of sit on that. You know, once it happened with the NBA, it was like, all right, like we feel something coming, and then it came. So it was like, cool. You know, so I, I don't think it was as scary as it could have been if they would have continued to have a show up there, you know, another week, you know, another week, and then, oh, let's, let's see how it goes. So I think, again, you know, the initial concern was for all of us as athletes, we're used to, you know, showing up to work every day and being sick and keep pushing through it and whatnot. So we, that was something that we've, we've known. That's a part of our profession. And, you know, much like football with injuries and certain stuff, you know, if you show up sick one day, you're like, oh, I can't play. You know, you got people being like, bro, what's wrong with you? You're tripping. Um, so I just think, the again, like the main thing for us was, that, you know, we're humans. People got kids. You know, Chris Bryant just had a baby. Um, you know, you had people kind of worried about what they were going to do with the family. So it wasn't as scary for us at the field. But then it got real when they started saying, all right, players are getting it. Let's go home. How did you decide that you were going to stay in Arizona? I just think that knowing that for certain we have this facility out here, um, for one, that I can get outside over there easy when I need to because um, there's, there's what, seven, eight fields to use. There's a bunch of grass. There's a bunch of space where we can go over there and work out and do stuff, and I can run whatnot right away from anyone. And we know it's not open to the public. Um, and then on top of that, Arizona is just an easy place to be able to move around, to be honest, you know, as far as staying away from people. Um, where we live, there's multiple grocery stores. There's, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of, you know, get out of the house, not have cabin fever, but still feel like, all right, we're being safe. You know, we're making sure we're not right on top of people. So that was just a big deciding factor in it, you know, honestly, because Chicago, it would have been great to be home um, right now. You know, my fiance, she's got family there. They live out in the suburbs, but we just knew just in case, like, let's not go over here and then, and then end up being stuck over in Chicago for travel, right? You know, so the, the bottom line was baseball being, you know, easy to, for me to still you know, be productive out here, but also we don't want to be stuck somewhere. I have friends. be stuck anywhere, let's be stuck here, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I have friends out in Arizona and they've said, like, throughout all of this that it's been, it's been interesting there because there's so much space. And that even with some of the stuff still being open, it feels like they're, there's, they're doing all the things right, but there's still room for everyone to just kind of be. So right. I, I imagine that there's some comfort in the fact that you could go outside. Because I will tell you that up until about a week and a half ago, it was right. snowing here. Like, right. that, that was, and, and that's <laughs> like driving Chicagoans crazy is – we have a nice day today. It's like 70 degrees today. It's perfect. I went for a walk, but mm-hmm. we had a, we had two, three inches of snow on the ground a week ago. Right. That's, yeah, so you, you want to be in the house, I mean, for the most part. Well, I remember 
I don't know, it might have been three weeks ago now, it feels like, where they asked us to, um, you know, to kind of put a message out, you know, asking people in Chicago, hey, please stay at home, you know, stay safe, whatever. Don't go out unless you need to. And that was a big concern of theirs was the weather because, you know, it had been obviously, you know, cold, snow, rain. And then they were like, all right, we see this forecast coming up. You know, it's about to get nice. We know people are going to get that itch. You know, come out and, and try and help us encourage people to stay home, even when the weather is great. Um, and that was, you know, about three weeks ago. So that weather, I know, is a huge factor that, that you bring that up. I already know people in Chicago are like, bro, let's go do something if it's nice. How are you handling not being around, like, the entire team every day or or not having a season to play because you guys would be a month into the season by now? So we've been keeping in touch with each other. Um, there's a group of guys out here that are still here. We still, you know, we pick and choose the days we go over to the field. Um, but it's it's always on our own, bro. It's so awkward. You know, like, hey, like, we're going over here, but, like, you don't see anybody. Um, but we do see each other on a Zoom chat. You know, every every week, you know, we try to meet up at least once on Zoom, checking with everybody. Of course, see how everyone's family's doing, how they're feeling, but then – we talk shop, we talk baseball, you know, we, we cut up, you know, we, we laugh, make sure everybody's good. You know, some people are barbecuing you know, with their family sometimes while we're doing it. Sometimes you know, people with their kids, um, you know, some people just at the house chilling, like, come on, man, Groundhog Day. Um, but it's just, it's been a great thing for us to stay connected. Um, you know, we all kind of have topics, like we've been watching The Last Dance, of course, and, you know, kind of chiming in on that and, you know, reflecting on, you know, how that's very similar to us right now in our situation. Um, so that's that's been fun for me. It's been a new, you know, a new fun. It's been a new, uh, I guess, a new variable, a new obstacle to have to go through, right, um, to, to throw in this, you know, awesome career that I've, I've been able to experience w- with all these people over, over these few years. But that's that's it, bro. Like, for me, I'm fortunate enough. I don't have to worry about obviously having a place to live. I don't have to worry about getting food. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not hurting. I know there are a lot of people in, in a lot of situations, man, that, that can't say that. They can't say they know they're going to be inside. Can't say they know where the next meal is going to come from right now. Can't pay bills. So for me, I'm, you know, I'm calm. Um, I got no complaints. I'm in no position to complain. That's, that's my mindset. Since you brought up the last dance, let me tell you about something that happened earlier today. I had a conversation with Joe Madden and I I texted Joe as I was watching episode three. Mm -hmm. And I said, Joe, I'm watching Phil Jackson and his approach. And it reminds me of your approach. And so I got Joe on the radio show today and we talked about it. You play for Joe. You're, you're a a Jordan fan. You've Mm -hmm. been watching this documentary is that a fair assessment that Phil Jackson's vibe is similar to Joe's vibe? Very fair. Very, very fair. Um, I mean, I feel like, especially, you know, how we do in Chicago, we're very sports savvy. You know, I feel like it's a sports savvy city, right? People pay attention to the little details, um, you know, more than the next city. So it's, it's hard to not throw that in there. The glasses, the white hair, the beards, you know, obviously, um, you know, the, the history making, Right. And, and, and the turn, you know, the, the turn of time in, in the city, uh, you know, kind of pass someone passed the torch to them. You see the organization trying to make something happen and then out of nowhere, boom, you, know, you, you get excitement, you get winning expectation um, and you, you get out of the box thinking. I feel like that's one thing you probably hear, you know, a lot in the, in the last dance is, you know, the way Phil thinks out of the box. So very similar, bro. When did you become a Jordan fan? I saw you rocking that 45 jersey. Mm-hmm. Man, for me, growing up, my pops played basketball in college. His uncle played for John Wooden at UCLA. Um, so it was just it was just natural. You know, my dad loved Dr. J. He loved Clyde Drexler, um, you know, Walt Frazier, just a lot of names and, and guys that I was able to watch with him that I didn't get to see play live, right? But then I got to see Michael play live. I got to see him you know, go through this run with the Bulls in the 90s. You know, I was born in 89. So just with Pops, it was very easy to stay in tune and stay focused to Jordan. So just watching his tapes, watching his games, just watching, I mean, what we're seeing now, just getting chills like, dang, bro, this, this man playing a game out here with, 
with people. And, and I was at a young age able to tell. So that was, for me, it was very easily, um, you know, in the early 90s to pick up, like, this, this dude is serious. And he's also, he's changing the world by playing basketball. So, so I threw it out to, to the people this week. Look, I'm, I'm a Chicago dude. I grew up in Chicago. I was 16 when they won their first title, okay? Uh-huh. And then I was working in the business when the 97, 98 team. So I'm, there's part of me that's kind of like, am I going to end up in this documentary? Uh-huh. Like, am I somewhere holding a microphone in 1998 right. with terrible hair and terrible clothes? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I keep – I'm so curious about how younger people – look at this because you were young when this was happening you were nine mm-hmm. years old when when this whole thing concluded so what's it like for you as an adult and a professional athlete that's won the championship to look at Jordan now versus what you were looking at when you were a kid I would say for me it's very similar to Jay-Z you know I remember being five years old and playing in one of my boys' driveway in the neighborhood, shooting some hoops, and his older brother coming out in the driveway listening to his Walkman, and he's like, hey, listen to this. And then I hear, dun, 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 dun. I hear Big Pimp, and I'm like, I don't know what this is. I'm five years old, but, like, it sounds dope, right? <laughs> so, you know, Jay-Z was established. He was there. You know, he was changing the world already with music before I knew it, and then I got to grow up listening and see what he was doing in my culture, my age. And what, 2007, Kingdom Come, you know, he dropped, you know, the whole um, show me what you got. And then I got to keep seeing him go. But then as an adult, look back and see him, like what he did before that. And now appreciate the before, appreciate my present when I was coming through high school and then after. Um, so for me, much like Jay-Z, that's what it was with Michael. Like I was saying, I watched him growing up with my pops, was able to appreciate that, not really understand how great it was exactly what he was doing on the court. But now as an athlete, as an adult, it's like, bro, this, this shit was hard. You know, this, this shit he did was hard. And, and to know he went at it with that animosity, with that enthusiasm at an early age, bro, it's, it's even more impressive as you go, as, as you get older and realize what he went through to get where he was. Which player do you most identify with? Which player... In the last dance, which one do you most identify Shoot. with? I mean, Michael, I, to be honest, um, coming up in my hometown, uh, you know, getting drafted by Atlanta Braves, uh, you know, have great first season, you know, all-star, all this stuff, and then my second year, get hurt and have a shoulder injury, but not really know all the ins and outs of, oh, this is a business until then. You know, coming up through the minor leagues, you know, I've, Worked my ass off, played hard. You know, I would play with little injuries, this and that. But then, you know, it was okay then. But then you get to the big leagues and you realize, all right, you know, same deal. But nah, like this is a business, bro. You feel me? Like to have a GM tell me to go out on the field and try to push back early from a shoulder injury because my bobblehead day is coming up next Wednesday. Like, bro, I'm not, I know I'm not ready to play, right? But my GM's like, nah, I need you to come and get out here on the field. And, and be back to ready to play when the team gets back to Atlanta. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here at 21 years old? Um, so I related to that stuff and then having to overcome that stuff and, and kind of duke it out, you know, a little bit back and forth on the business side with, with my organization, you know, early on in my career and realized, like, th- this is something else besides just me playing ball. You know, I want to go out here and win, and they got other stuff on their mind. Is it hard to – because you've been playing baseball at a high level since you were a kid. Like, you love the game, and it comes across. Mm-hmm. Was it hard to understand the business aspect of the game? I would say – I don't want to say hard to understand. I would just say hard to overcome, hmm. you know, to, to a certain extent. I feel like a lot of us, you know, I mean, you see Scotty. You no, know, he, he went through with that, you know, um, in the last dance. But I feel like all of us, a lot of us, not knowing that, especially I, bro, coming someone coming out of high school, um, you love the game. You get here, you just want to compete, you just want to have fun. Like you're used to the failure and the struggle. That happens. Like play baseball your whole life, you're gonna lose, you're gonna, you know, have slumps, whatnot. But then when you have people, you know, telling you you're something you're not, trying to make you be something else, you know, trying to hold you down when you're hurt, you know, just just all this stuff, just trying to make you a lot of things that you're not. They create a lot more obstacles. So I would say that that's the toughest part 
about dealing with the business side when you want to just go play and you just want to ball. I feel like your teammate KB did a great job of navigating this from the time that he got to the major leagues. But even this past spring training, I thought that he did a masterful job of being like, look, I love baseball and I love the Cubs, but I do understand that this is a business. For, for you guys in the clubhouse, what was it like to see him handle that as professionally as he did? I would say, personally, I knew what he was going through. You know, um, I've been there, and and I've and I've kind of had that you know respect and, and admiration since I got to this team, just knowing what that was like. So I've always tried to, you know, not sugarcoat anything for him, but just be understanding of that with what he's going through on a daily basis. But I think as a whole, you no, know, we were all kind of like you know waiting to see you know, how's he handle it, how's he going to handle it, what's going to happen. You know, because we know it's a lot of pressure. And, and with the, as many things as he's done in the game, you, know, you want to say he has every right to not be happy or he has every right to speak however he wants to speak, right, in, in this situation. But at the same time, we all know, like, how dope it is, how fun it is to have a winning group here in Chicago and what it's like to try and win the World Series. We just were hoping that nothing shook him so much that it was going to come out in a bad way and make him look like someone he's not. And I feel like all in all, bro, like he was the MVP that we know he is. And, and to me, he hustles. He's a humble MVP, you know, regardless of the struggles that, that they go through on a daily basis of, of expectation. He, he's a humble person. And, and I'm happy that he came out on this side of it. And he seemed very, very relieved, um, you know, on top of having good news that his wife was doing well at the time with, with, with the baby on the way. And now, you know, fortunately, that they seem to be doing well with that. Your clubhouse seems to be filled with mature dudes that get it. How hard is that to, to, to have? Because, I mean, I'm sure you've been in some clubhouses that didn't have all of that. I'm going to be honest. I've been, I've been super fortunate. I, th I think, uh, you know, the seven playoffs in 10 years, you know, says, says a lot of that, about that with the clubhouses I've been in. Um, I came up in a very veteran-filled clubhouse in Atlanta early on when I was 20. I think this, honestly, stepping into Chicago's clubhouse when I first got here was the toughest. And, and for the right reasons, though. Because bro, you got these dudes, young as hell, right? No, nothing but the Chicago Cubs of today, where, you, where everything's first class, world class, new clubhouse, new stadium, um, bringing in Joe Madden, nothing but positive vibes, right? And, and they know nothing but success. You know, in 2015, playing against them, you see them take a huge leap in, in franchise history, but sports history, and like, all right, look, well, we're going to go play against the Cardinals in the first round of the playoffs, first time it's ever happened, and then we're going to make the NLCS in a year where we weren't even supposed to be here yet, right? Um, so, so that just does something to someone, bro. It brings a lot of things at, at you fast. Um, then you go win the World Series. You got Addie Russell, youngest player to hit a Grand Slam in, in World Series history, and you just, you just hope that all the success – doesn't not break these guys down but doesn't cripple them because I know what it's like to lose I know what it's like to not have a team that has everything we had and they had to learn that and I think that's what it was like this past year uh you know not making the postseason so just watching these guys grow and mature into how the business is going to treat them right how the you know how the rest of the league is going to adjust to all right you're, you're the big bad Cubs well you know show us what you got and and I think they've done a great job of handling it but I think Early on, when you have a young clubhouse, you know, the veterans slowly but surely kind of, you know, fade off into the rest of their career with another team or they retire. There's a lot of responsibility on a lot of young guys that have been in that position before. What's it going to be like to have Rossi as your manager? Because you've known this guy since you were a kid yeah. in this game. Yeah. This, this is my locker mate for my first three years. Um, this, this, for playing for Rossi, is, it just gives me chills. And I think it gives a lot of us chills because we know what his intensity is, right? We, we know he knows how to push our buttons. Um, we know we want to run through a wall for him. And, and there's no question. You know, we, we know we're going to get it straight for him, good, bad, and ugly. And I think that goes a long way with a group like ours, um, you know, who got some guys right now, you know, possibly going into free agency, some guys with contract talks, some guys – Lester pushing for Hall of Fame stuff. Um, you know, everyone's kind of in, in a different spot right now. We talked about, you know, last dance kind of vibe. Um, you know, the front office is in a different different spot. So I think he's the perfect guy for right now 
And I gotta, I gotta once again say hats off to the Cubs for for doing that. You know, knowing when to pull the trigger and, and get Joe Madden in here, and and also realizing like, hey, like this is where our group is right now. They need to hear a different voice. They need to hear a different message because you know, this one's not the same as this is not the same group that walked in here in 2015. What makes Rossi special? Oof, man, there there are a number of things. Um, I'm gonna start with selflessness. You know, his his book is, you know, not trying to plug his book or anything, but it's called Teammate. But it's called that for a reason. You know, that, that's not fake, um, you know, coming from him. Being a catcher that has been a starter in this game, been to the postseason, won multiple World Series, um, been a backup to a lot of great catchers. You no, know, he is a guy that never stops watching the game, never stops trying to get an edge um, during the game. And as a backup catcher in his role, bro, He's always watching everything. He's trying to give you, you know, whatever it is you need. If you need someone to be silly with you and funny with you, come on, he's got you. If you need someone to tell you to sit, sit down and shut the fuck up and watch the game, he's got you too. Um, and to me, the, flat, the fact that he's flexible with that but knows how to respect the grind of, of every player, pitchers as well because he was a catcher. And, and I think there's really something to, you know, when they say catchers make great managers, well, this guy's got it and he's got every bit of experience from playing with Hall of Famers, being on losing teams, being on winning teams, and, and doing it for 16 years. What's been the best part? I mean, obviously, you won a World Series, but what's been the best part of being a Cub? Ooh, it's a dream job. It is, it is a dream job. Um, you know, playing in two other stadiums, calling them my home stadium, you know, each have their, you know, I guess – Beautiful, each have their beautiful things about them. Atlanta, St. Louis, but Chicago, it's it's a sandlot, but it's it's the most beautiful sandlot you'll ever see. Um, you, you got the ivy, you got the bleachers, the new scoreboards out of touch, but it, it still makes it feel like a, a homey place. Um, Chicago as a sports culture, sports town, um, the vibe, the positivity, you know, just showing up for work every day, walking in that building, you know. You're here to play baseball, but you're here to have fun and to never look back. And to me, that has been the best thing about being a Cub. Man, Jay, I could talk to you forever, man. You got a lot of you got a lot of wisdom. You're too young to have this much wisdom. Man. <laughs> hey, that, that's 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 a gift and a curse, but that's that's the way it comes, bro. I, I appreciate it. But you ask you ask great questions, man. Great insight.